The lords of this land think our ways to be foolish. In this time of famine, they have forbidden us from wasting resources on our silly rituals to appease the dead. Instead of proper burials, our brethren are forced into mass graves, mere holes in the ground, unfit as a place of rest for even the most insignificant peasants. But they do not understand. These rituals, these sacred rites, are not for the benefit of those who have moved on to the next world. They are for the safety of those who still remain in this one. I can sense it in the air. It approaches ever closer. Only when they are face to face with the undeniable consequences of their actions will they truly understand. And in that moment, it will be too late. Hello and welcome to Monster of the Week, the show where we dig up old versions of creatures from past editions of D&D and other tabletop games and bring them to light for use in your current 5th edition game. My name is Josiah. And today we're going to be taking a bit of a left turn in terms of what we usually do on this show. While I very much do have a brand new and fascinating monster for Dungeons & Dragons 5th edition, and while there very much is a stat block for it in the description below that you can check out if you want to follow along or just use it in your 5e campaign, this monster is not from D&D's history, or even from another tabletop game altogether. The Gashido Kyoto is a monster from Japanese folklore, actually, and there doesn't exist a stat block or version of this creature in D&D's storied history, at least not that I could find. So we're talking about a mythical monster that has no ties to tabletop roleplaying yet, and the stat block is just totally created by yours truly. It hasn't been converted from another edition of the game. It's a very fascinating creature. The name, Gashado Kyoto, literally translates into English as Starving Skeleton, which it very much is. These massive humanoid creatures can tower up to over 15 feet tall, and they are truly terrifying. They come about when either famine or a great war has caused a lot of people to be killed and their bodies not tended to properly, either left out on the battlefield or just buried in mass graves, that kind of thing. But in any case, whichever way the remains of the once living people are disrespected, their spirits coalesce into an angry form that manifests itself as this giant skeletal creature. Something else about this creature I find very interesting is it has become insanely popular in pop culture, both here to an extent, but in Japan especially, and it's not like many of the Japanese myths, or myths from any culture really, that date back like hundreds of years. This creature was invented by a monster magazine in the 60s, and people just found it so interesting and so compelling that it became a part of Japanese folklore. So it's very much a modern piece of folklore, and that's kind of what got me into researching this particular creature. Now there is so much more to this creature than it simply just being a giant skeleton, lore discounted just as far as what it can do and how it fights. It really brings this frame, literally a skeleton of a creature, to the next level. So today we're going to talk about just exactly what this creature is capable of in battle, some plot hooks and ideas for how you might want to use this in your own D&D game at home, and why I think this monster has a place amongst the myriad of other creatures we already have and at your table in Dungeons & Dragons. But first things first, get that scroll of true sight ready, because it's time for... So the most defining characteristic of this monster, and what really separates it from any other huge creature like this that you've seen before, is the fact that it's invisible. Not only is it invisible, this creature can't be detected unless it's within 60 feet of you. If you are more than 60 feet away from the Gashin de Kyoto, you can't see it, you can't hear it, and it doesn't leave any trace behind, like footprints or anything like that, that you'd be able to detect. Unless, of course, it's climbing through trees or something. The tree You're going to see the trees moving, but you can't actually see this creature until it's right on top of you. That's terrifying, and I thought it was so interesting that there would be a creature like this that's just so huge and threatening and imposing, 
but it's invisible. It's stealthy, which is not usually something we put together in those circumstances. But all that said, it's not completely impossible to detect, at least it is by conventional means, but there are two ways you'd be able to detect this creature coming. One, of course, is if you have true sight, that's going to supersede any magical, obscuring magic that this creature has as part of its being. But the other is that this creature emits a soft, dull, ringing tone that can be heard by anyone within 400 feet. And it's quiet at first, but the closer it gets to you, the louder this soft ringing becomes. So even if it's moving carefully not to disturb the area around it so that its victims won't know it's coming, a savvy traveler will at the very least be able to detect this sound and know something is off, and one who is informed about the legends of this creature will know that they need to find a place to hide or get ready to fight. Because once this thing gets up close and personal, its true savage nature comes out. Again, this is a creature manifest from angry, disgruntled, and cheated spirits. Those beings who all they left behind was this such anger towards the living and how they were treated and the unfairness of their deaths that it manifested in this literal embodiment of death itself. So in combat, they are just ferocious. They are literally starving for the blood of the living. And this is what kind of ties in that theme of those dying of starvation and being dumped in mass graves. That sense of desperation carries over with them and as they starve for the blood of the living, that is exactly what they will do in combat. They will attack people with their massive hands. They have two claw attacks that cause a pretty decent amount of damage and also manage to grapple their targets if they hit. And then of course they have a bite attack. And following the lore of this creature, what they will try to do is bite off the head of their victims and drink their blood, which of course isn't going to do anything to sustain this creature because it is a giant skeleton. It's just going to be getting blood all over its body. But the necrotic energies imbued within this creature actually do give it some temporary hit points if it's able to succeed in doing this. And of course, the wording and the way I've created this bite attack is that the bite causes a fair amount of damage and if it reduces a creature to zero hit points, that creature is killed instantly. Similar to the way a Mind Flayer's brain extraction works, this creature is trying to bite the head off of its enemies. And this is all, like I said, very true to the legend of the Gasha de Kyoto. It seeks out wayfarers, travelers, anyone it can isolate to try to bite their head off and drink their blood. But as fascinating as that is, from a lore perspective, it didn't really feel like it was quite enough. Like, this would have been a cool creature as is, but I felt we needed to add one more thing at least just to make it a little bit more iconic and really ramp up the tension for a potential encounter. So, with that said, we're going to take a look at some... So I wanted to give this creature something memorable as an ability, something that would really leave a lasting impact long after the encounter was over. So I gave it an ability I call Envelop in Darkness, which essentially allows it to create a wall of dark energy. It functions very similarly to the spell Wall of Ice, except instead of ice, it is indeed dark necrotic energy, a literal one foot thick wall of dark light that covers an 80 foot dome. So as an action, it can create this dome, and this dome is impossible to see through on either side. A creature who wants to can pass through this wall of dark energy, but if they do so, they have to make a constitution save, and even if they succeed on said save, they're going to take a bit of necrotic damage for doing so, and a creature that ends its turn within 5 feet of the wall is also going to take a bit of necrotic damage. The reason I gave it this ability is just because from a narrative and encounter focus, I think this makes a lot of sense. And I think it is a monster that is unusual. We don't have a lot of creatures that behave like this. It can stealthily hunt a party and they'll hear that ringing getting louder and louder. They know something's coming. And then suddenly this dome of darkness just comes over them and they are isolated now. They can't see out of it. They don't know really what's happening. And of course that will block any light coming in as well. So they'll need to strike up torches. This could happen during the day even. It would go into total darkness, which I think is really thematic and cool. But then this giant monster that's been hunting the party finally comes into view. It materializes as it passes over that threshold where the players are now able to see it and they're trapped in this dome with this massive skeletal creature that wants to kill them and that's exactly why it's there. Now of course this doesn't completely eliminate the option of them running but that's something they have to figure out is if they can pass through this wall at all and how they can do that 
or maybe they have to dispel it somehow if they have magic that's able to do something like that. There's a lot of different solutions to this, but I think what's interesting about this choice to give it this ability is it creates a problem that isn't just I stand there and swing with my sword. It gives the players choices about how they want to deal with it, and I think that's what ultimately makes combat interesting in D&D is multiple choices and how those choices pan out based on what, as a party, you decide to do. But hunting the party and isolating them like that is just one of the many ways you could use this thing. So let's move on and talk about some... So, the Gashi de Kyoto can be used in many different ways, the most obvious of which being, of course, as a random encounter. The party might be adventuring through an ancient battlefield that they're not even aware was at one time a center for this huge conflict, or possibly a place where there were bodies left in mass graves in a town that has long since faded from history, and encounter one of these things. The encounter itself won't reveal too much about the creature's origins, but maybe later on they can start to discover why they encountered this creature or creatures if there's multiple of them or they keep encountering the same one over and over again. Or for something that's more relevant to what's happening with the party right now, perhaps they go into a town that is currently suffering from a famine or a drought and there's lots of people that are dying and that's ultimately kind of put a damper on the entire town. Everybody has that mood of just being downtrodden and sad because that is a very difficult thing for a community to go through. So of course maybe the players decide they want to help, but in trying to solve this problem, one of the obstacles is that the bodies that aren't being tended to properly are rising up into these giant skeletal creatures. Or maybe there's just one of them that keeps getting bigger and bigger every time bodies are just left out as carrion. You could even throw this as an adventure hook to a lower level party where fighting this Gashida Kuro isn't going to be an option for them because it's so much more powerful than them. But finding a way to put those spirits to rest is how they can ultimately defeat the creature. So in a brute force conflict, they will for sure be killed and make sure they know that, of course. So it's something to be feared and it's something that they run from. And when they hear that ringing in their ears start to come, they know we need to hide. We need to get out of here because the Gashi de Kuro is coming and it's going to kill all of us if it gets too close. But if they're able to find a way to put those spirits to rest, maybe by gathering certain items required to conduct some kind of ritual or just by saving the town and ensuring that the ancestors of those people that have passed away are going to be safe and be able to live happy lives might be enough to quell the wrath of those spirits. And who knows, that could be an interesting adventure for a lower level group while still having a very high level threat kind of looming on the horizon. These things would also make amazing minions for a necromancer, especially if they're used in kind of an ambush tactic type of way. Because imagine if the party goes into encounter the big bad of the first arc that you're doing in your campaign, and that big bad happens to be a necromancer, and they're getting ready to throw down, they think they have him solo and away from all of his minions, and then suddenly they start to hear this ring as combat is going on. And maybe you've even seeded this idea earlier that there are these giant skeletal creatures that emit this sound. By the third round of combat, it's like deafeningly loud, and then suddenly these two huge skeletons come into play. That would create a big dramatic moment for an encounter like that, and definitely hold potential to sway things against them and tip the scales in favor of the bad guys, unless the party's prepared for something like this, of course. And maybe it's eventually revealed that the necromancer in this case is the one who's causing the famine by killing off all of the life energy in the fields of the farmers so that people are starving to death specifically so that he could make these giant creatures. And maybe that's the key to defeating the necromancer is revealing this information, making it common knowledge and somehow conveying that to the spirits of these deceased so they know that they shouldn't be directing their wrath just aimlessly and obeying this necromancer who holds some kind of magical sway over them. They should break that sway that he has over them and turn against the one who's responsible for the suffering that they've been inflicted. But in any case, I think the Gashi de Kuro is fascinating and definitely belongs in D&D because it creates a nice dichotomy of a creature that is both immense in scale but also stealthy and completely silent until you're actually face to face with it, which I think is pretty rare and also pretty cool. And I think that's pretty rare and also something that I could definitely make use of in many different settings. 
So if you do want to use this creature in your game, as I mentioned earlier, there is a stat block for it in the description below. Uh, you will find a link to a Google document that has everything there you need to run this creature. And if you happen to be one of my fantastic patrons, of course, on the Patreon page, you can find a monster manual style stat block that I have done up for this creature as well. And as always, I'm curious to know what you guys think of this monster, especially considering this is the first one I've done just kind of straight up from scratch. I'd like to know what you think of the monster itself, as well as some ways that you would use this in your campaign. Either if you kind of like some of the ideas I've pitched, or if you've got ideas of your own, definitely leave a comment below and tell me all about that, or on Twitter or Discord. I do appreciate you guys showing up, watching these videos, it means a lot with all the craziness going on with the whole YouTube thing and people's videos not showing up in their sub box and all that nonsense. It makes me very happy to know that you guys are out there and that you share my videos all the time. I always get mentions on Reddit and stuff of people tossing the links around and it's great. I honestly can't thank this community enough. You guys are awesome and thank you so much for watching. I will see you in the next video. Until then.